Okay, great. Um, well, welcome and uh, good evening. Um, thank you for coming to tonight's book talk um, for Safe Haven United Kingdom's investigations into Nazi collaborators and the failure of justice by Robert Sherwood and John Silverman. Uh, so I'm very pleased to be introducing our two speakers. My name is Stephanie Rauch, uh, representing the library here. Um, I'll quickly introduce uh, the two speakers and then hand over to them. Um, just to let you know about the format that we will be hearing from um, John and Bob for about 45 minutes, and there will be time for questions uh, afterwards. If you have a question in the audience, uh, just wait until I come around with the microphone. Otherwise, um, the audience at home uh, who's joining us via Zoom won't be hearing your questions. And likewise, those who are joining us online, uh, please put your questions into the chat, and then my colleague Martina will read out your questions later. Uh, also, um, the book uh, is available for sale after the event, um, and you can also get your copy signed uh, if you like. Right, so uh, just to introduce um, our two speakers, John Silverman, for those who don't know him already, uh, was a BBC journalist, BBC news journalist for 26 years. He was a correspondent in Paris and spent 13 years as home affairs correspondent and reported extensively on the UK's Nazi war crimes inquiries for the Today programme. He has been a research oh. professor at the University of Bedfordshire since 2007, where he has focused on the media and justice in post-conflict states, publishing on topics relating to research work in West and East Africa and involvement of the International Criminal Court. Robert Sherwood was an operational Metropolitan Police Detective. I know, come on. In the Metropolitan Police. You can come up here. Come on. Building on an honors law degree, he studied for an MA in Holocaust studies, comparing the war crimes teams of the UK and US, research that he took further for his doctorate on the UK war crimes team since 1945. Come on. 2020. And since then, he has been focusing on various. Come on, baby girl. Um, I'll now hand over Come to on. John and um, look forward to your talk. Great. Thank you very much for uh, Good evening to everybody. Uh, joined us online. Um, we're going to start by playing a TV news report uh, from the 1990s, which will help put in context some of the themes that we're going to pick up later on and which form the, the basis of the book. So, Stephanie. Right, Anthony Savoniuk is 76 and lives in a one-bedroom flat in East London. He's been under investigation by Scotland Yard for more than two years. When we tried to question him about his past, he became very agitated. Although we didn't pursue him, Savoniuk went to find a weapon. He returned with a lump of rusting metal. We were forced to move swiftly away. This is where the alleged crimes took place, the small town of Demacheva in the southwest of Belarus. In 1941, when the Germans invaded, Savoniuk was the deputy commander of police. Theodor Zan has lived here all his life and was at school with Savoniuk. Scotland Yard have told him that he'll be a witness if there's a trial in England. He took me to a mass grave in the forest and explained how, while hiding, he saw Savoniuk kill a group of Jewish women in cold blood. He told them to get undressed and said, put your clothes over there. He made them lie on the ground with their faces down. Then they were all machine guns. In 1941, there were 4,000 Jews living in the area. Within 18 months, all but a handful had been slaughtered by the Germans and local collaborators. Ivan Baglai has been interviewed as an eyewitness several times by war crimes detectives. He's also agreed to give evidence in England. Savoniuk was known to everyone in all the villages. He killed Russians as well as Jews. Yes, he was known as the cruelest killer in the police force. This is testimony from one of the few Jewish survivors who lives in Israel. This evidence too will be put forward at a trial. 
Savoniuk's solicitor said his client strenuously denied the allegations and pointed out that he'd voluntarily been interviewed by the police. But in Demarchevo, hundreds of bodies, men, women and children, lie in a mass grave. And more than 20 witnesses will say Savoniuk was responsible for many of the deaths. This is one of the forgotten killing grounds of Europe, but for some, the horrors of the Nazi occupation are still fresh. Now they're waiting to see if, improbably, their story will be told in an English courtroom. John Silverman, BBC News, Demarchova in Belarus. So um, that man, Antony Andre Savoniuk, was the only person convicted under the 1991 War Crimes Act. And the, I suppose the research questions which really triggered the book were how it, was it that out of 274 uh, suspects in England and Wales, and a further 17 in Scotland at the time the Act was passed, there was only one conviction. And just as intriguingly, who were some of the people who were investigated but not prosecuted, and what was the strength of evidence against them? So uh, I'll hand over to Bob now, who's going to talk about how this unique piece of legislation, the 1991 Act, came about. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, apologize. Thank you again, everyone from uh, the Vina for inviting John and I here. Before I actually start, I'd like to make a presentation to you of our book for your library. So would someone like to come and collect that? Yeah. There you go. It's not signed. Thank, thank, you. thank you very much indeed. Okay. Uh, as John said, my, my role, the first part of my talk is how the 1991 war crimes team and the act came about. Uh, I think it's important to differentiate between the post-war teams, the 1945, the end of the war, who investigated war crimes, and the teams in the 1990. Uh, one of the main differences was the 1945 team, and the team immediately after the war throughout the world were focusing on Nazis, focusing on Germans and Axis people. And the concentration camps were run by, primarily by Nazis and other people who were prosecuted. Nuremberg trials, there was 12 plus the Nuremberg Military Tribunal, which was the one where Goring stood trial at and committed suicide the night before he was due to be executed in December 46. These, the, the perpetrators for those offences were the senior Nazis. But it was, it was not recognised, or it was, but it, it really wasn't identified that the Nazis would not succeeded in their aims and in genocide and the Holocaust without the assistance of the local indigenous population in some cases. And consequently, over the years, this became more and more apparent. The Russians tried very hard to extradite people from the United Kingdom to their country, and they had a very good uh, commission, a very good squad set up, but we weren't really talking to the Russians very much after much about 1948, so it was put in the too difficult bin and basically ignored. Uh, many, many Eastern Europeans came over to Great Britain after the war, having worked for the Nazis. Some had, some hadn't. And because of the change in the war, they joined the Nazis, they joined the Allies and came to Great Britain. Uh, we were willing to take people on. We were willing because we, our population had dwindled. We needed manpower, we needed people to work the fields. And there was a scheme called the European Voluntary Workers Scheme, which was designed to allow people to come in the country. And the vetting was pretty minimal. And I think it was sometimes, I think it was just a customs officer for 20 minutes in the church hall asking questions. Yes, 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 yes. So it wasn't really regulated. So move forward to about 1986. And uh, Simon Wiesenhal, who some of you may know of, I'm sure a lot of you do, and Mark and I, who's a friend of mine, were talking about this earlier. He had an office in Los Angeles, and uh, a guy who ran that, a bloke called Ephraim Zurov, who subsequently has taken Wiesenhal's role as a Nazi hunter, produced a list of 17 potential Eastern European Nazis who were living in Great Britain, and handed that 
to the consulate in Los Angeles. And it came over to England and it was pretty much ignored. But an MP, Greville Jenner, who some of you may know of, I see some people nodding, uh, and I'm not here to talk about what the obligations against Mr. Jenner were subsequently, that's not what we're here for. In this respect, he did a very, very good job. He brought it up and it was ignored, but he managed to push it to a degree that he formed, uh, with others, a working party in Parliament, cross-party, to look into war crimes. And it was headed and chaired by Merlin Rees, the former Home Secretary, who was respected on both sides of the House, and they were very active. And they pushed it, and eventually Douglas Hurd, who was the Home Secretary, managed to, about 1990, 1989, 1990, produced, uh, got the former Director of Public Prosecutions, Hetherington, William Hetherington, and William Chalmers, who was the equivalent in Scotland to do a report called the Hetherington Chalmers Report, which was issued, and consequently from that, legislation was changed after some of a battle getting it through Parliament. <laughs> Got to read it out. I do apologise for this. It was Thomas Hetherington, my apologies. And it, uh, the proceedings were that uh, any person in the UK, regardless of nationality, can be charged for murder, manslaughter, or culpable homicide committed in Germany or its occupant occupied territories from the 1st of September 1939, when the Poles were invaded by Germany, to the 5th of June 1945, which Russia recognised as the end of the Second World War. Very wide and retrospective legislation took a bit of a struggle. The Parliament Act was implemented, so it didn't get the Lords rejected it, but eventually the House of Commons passed it. So in 1991, beginning of uh, May 1991, a War Crimes Act was passed, and a war crimes team was formed for the Metropolitan Police, my old organisation. I didn't know anything about it. It was kept very quiet. It was recruited by a very senior detective who made inquiries of his colleagues of the same rank and they identified suitable officers. Uh, I regret to say that some of these officers possibly didn't have the background required to do the work. It was a specific, specific work. They were looking at it as a normal murder. And in fact, it was not like a real murder. If anything, it would be like a in a murder, normally a body is found, who is it? And then you work out that person's background and you move forward to find a potential suspect. In these cases, it's all well and good having suspects, but you've got to make sure hey, they're still alive, living here, and is there evidence to connect them with the murder? They're not going to get any forensic evidence, obviously not 50 odd years afterwards, but there are other ways of getting evidence as well, so it's a complete turnaround. But they did get a conviction, and John will go on to all that in a minute. And the, the squad started in 1991 and abruptly finished in 1990. And one of the sad things about it was they didn't do a report on the squad and the work they did, which as historians would be extremely valuable to read and learn about for the future. Similarly with 1945, the other units throughout the Commonwealth who had similar teams in Canada, the United States were still working, Canada, to a degree, are. Australia and New Zealand have produced reports, which are extremely valuable, and I used them a lot when I was doing my research. Sadly, the Metropolitan Police didn't do this, and all the papers on the various inquiries they did for all the inquiries and all the cases they investigated, and there was two people charged, and say, so well, John will go on to, those papers are embargoed until 20. 49, so it's going to outlive me, it's going to outlive John, and possibly most of you in here, a little sadly. So there's nothing much to work from on there. But I will now pass you, you now you, I think you understand how it was formed and what they did. And they did do a great job of getting a conviction. I'll pass you on to John to go on to the specifics about that. Okay, thanks, Bob. Um, I think it's important to say, I mean, the, the reason that um, we've started from the wartime period is that there is a kind of synergy between the way that the uh, war crimes teams were put together during the war. These were um, military inquiries and they were carried out under the auspices of the Judge Advocate General. Um, and of course the later inquiries in the 90s were police inquiries. But there was an awful lot of kind of serendipity about how these teams were assembled. Uh, Bob mentioned Greville Janner, I mean, he was, demobbed I think in 1945 or early 46 and a friend rang him up and said what are you going to do now 
do you fancy becoming a war crimes investigator? He never thought about it before. He didn't have any training. And he turned up at an office in Whitehall the next day uh, and he had some cursory training and he became a war crimes investigator. Um, similarly, in the 1990s, the way that the Met Police put their war crimes team together was not looking for people who necessarily had any expertise in investigating war crimes or even any people who had interest in history but somebody, uh, a senior officer like a chief inspector would be told to go and choose someone that they were aware of, maybe that they were due a move from an area, murder squad or whatever, and the team was assembled in that way. But there was no great expertise in the teams. Um, I said at the beginning that one of the motivations for writing the book was to look at the people who weren't prosecuted. Um, we know about the guy in the film, Anthony Savoniuk, who was a fairly low level uh, police auxiliary, a Schutzmannschaft in Belarus. Um, he did commit many, many war crimes, uh, although he was only charged because under UK law, you can only be charged with one specific murder. He could well have murdered hundreds of people. Um, but what about some of the people that weren't prosecuted? And the fact that there wasn't any uh, end of inquiry report done in England and Wales means that nothing was put in the public domain about some of the people that were investigated and not prosecuted. And I'll just give you two very brief case histories. One is a man who at the time that the 1991 Act was passed, was thought to have been the strongest case for uh, first prosecution, um, is a man called Harris Fikeris. Uh, he was a Latvian who lived in Milton Keynes, and he was a senior commander in the Arras Commando. Now, the Arras Commando was one of the most uh, anti-Semitic, uh, violent nationalist militias operating in Eastern Europe during the Second World War. Uh, its head, uh, Victor Arras, uh, was briefly in British custody at the end of the war. He somehow escaped, but he eventually got uh, arrested in Germany in the 1970s and sentenced to life imprisonment. Now, Svikeris was a battalion commander uh, and he was so senior that at times when Arras himself was away, uh, Svikeris deputized for him. Um, the Arras commando murdered um, probably about 30,000 people in Latvia uh, after the German invasion in uh, the summer of 1941. Um, and in fact, two of the killings in the, the Rumbula, Rumbula forest outside Riga were the biggest single um, set of murders in the so-called Holocaust by bullets, apart from Babin Yar, which most of you will have heard of outside Kiev. So um, the Arras Commando was a very formidable uh, unit. Um, and I just want to read you a comment that was made about this man, Svikaris, by the head of Scotland Yard's war crimes unit. Shortly after he retired, I spoke to him. His name was uh, Detective Chief Superintendent Eddie Bathgate. And he said to me, Svikaris was a powerful case and I would cheerfully have put him on the charge sheet. The more the war crimes unit investigated him, the stronger the case got. There was no dispute about identification. He was a volunteer and admitted during the interviews that he was present when massacres took place without an actual confession of guilt. Moreover, he led the unit when its head, Victor Arras, was away. Svikeris was not prosecuted. Um, and I'm going to explain later on why he wasn't prosecuted. Just briefly give you another case history, a man that some of you might have heard of called Anton or Antonas Gekas, who lived in Edinburgh and was a senior officer in the Lithuanian 12th Auxiliary Battalion 
which like uh, the Arras Commando was a murderous outfit which um, committed atrocities, uh, particularly in Belarus during the war. Uh, and one of those atrocities in a town called Slutsk was notable for having been mentioned at the Nuremberg International Tribunal because the manner of the killings was so horrific. Uh, and in fact, the um, senior German officer present said, whatever happens in the future, he was writing to his own uh, commander, please keep this outfit, the Lithuanian Auxiliary Battalion, away from me. Now, Gekas um, was present at that massacre and many others. He was a senior officer in the uh, Auxiliary Battalion. Um, and I'll read you another comment, which was made um, in the late 1980s. Um, Scottish television did a couple of very good, hard-hitting documentaries about Gekas. Um, and confirming actually that he was a war criminal. And they interviewed various people who were still alive at that time, who'd been members of his own uh, battalion. Uh, and this man who they interviewed uh, called Alexinus um, said, he named his direct commander at as Gekas. And he said, quotes, he stood on the edge of the pit and gave the order to fire. After executions, he would check the pits and finish off anyone still alive with his pistol. The corpses were one and a half meters deep. Now, um, Gekas <laughs> is the only case I know of where a suspected war criminal has decided to launch a libel suit against the media. He very unwisely sued Scottish television for their report and including that comment that I just read out. And he lost. And a High Court judge in Edinburgh said that on the evidence that was presented, and remember, this was a civil trial, it wasn't beyond reasonable doubt. Um, but it was quite a long trial and a lot of evidence was given. And the judge said, I'm sa satisfied uh, that Gekas is a war criminal. But Gekas, like Svikeris, was never prosecuted. So I'm going to leave it hanging there as to why they weren't prosecuted. I hope I'll tantalize you by, you know, waiting for the answer. But I'll hand back to uh, Bob now to take up the story. Thank you. Right. Uh, I'm going to quickly talk about how the 1945 war crimes team came about. George already alluded to how the lack of preparation. In fact, that lack of preparation was highlighted in the Hetherington Chalmers report that they weren't ready at all. Uh, Auschwitz was liberated in January 1945. The Allies did talk to each other. Churchill, Stalin and Roosevelt were conversing. I appreciate Roosevelt died in the early part of 45, but he, they were certainly conversing. They had meetings. Belson was liberated on the 15th of April 1945 and uh, by the 63rd Anti-Tank Regiment, I believe it was. And when they arrived there, they had absolutely no idea what they were seeing and what it was. Uh, the, the commandant, Joseph Kramer, came out with a white stick and said, there's some people in there, prisoners in this typhoid. And it's a bit dangerous. And these guys went in, and I think we all know the story about the wonderful humanitarian exercise that took place, operation with medical staff, with junior doctors, with trainee doctors, and they saved many, many lives, but sadly so many other people died as well. I went there in uh, April for the annual memorial service they hold each year to commemorate the uh, liberation. And it, it really is quite a moving occasion. If anyone gets a chance to do that, I recommend you do it. Consequently, as a result of that, they could see people dying. They could see what happened. They had to do something about it. And they had a, a small unit of military policemen attached to them who took some very basic statements. Now, the military police had their own investigation branch, which had been formed, ironically, by a result of an inquiry done by a Metropolitan Police Detective Chief Inspector in 1940, called Hatherall, went to France when the BAF were there before Dunkirk, because they weren't really, the military police were just glorified security guards and there was a lot of issues. So he went over there, realised they had little knowledge of crime matters, so he said, you need to have an investigation branch. And they formed it. 
There's a lot of ex-policemen, and it was quite an active unit. And why they weren't used, I have no idea. Even the guy who wrote the book about redcoats, Gary Shetherd, I asked him, I met him, he didn't know either. So you no know, one knows why. But consequently, interesting, Hatherall was the officer in charge of the Great Train Robbery Inquiry as well in 1963, which I think most of us know of or will be conscious of, just to show the actual time difference is not that vast. Consequently, they took some basic statements, and in the, after about a week, they put, uh, war crimes units were approved, adopted. A head was, uh, a bloke called Tony Barrowcroft was appointed. He never went anywhere near Germany, he stayed in Brussels, which had been liberated, which I don't think was a good move. And the guy who was deputed to investigate that particular unit was a guy by the name of Leo Gen, who was an actor. And some of us who have been around a few years will remember the Wooden Horse movie, which he was in, and Quo Vardis, another movie. And he was a very active actor, a bit too active. And I felt, having read his memoirs, which were at Duxford, in the Imperial War Museum at Duxford, having read them, I think he was more interested in his work as a thespian than he was his work as an investigator. And he used to, put, and he, he managed to get Lawrence Livia and Sybil Thorndike to come to the camp to give a play uh, to the officers there, to his staff. And they had dinners called the Crime Club, and they had the tie produced. And they, even when they had the Belston Inquiry and the conviction was done, they had a cake made of Erno Brees, who was one of the guards, hanging in an effigy, hanging from a piece of string, which I think, yeah, I can see your face, sir, which I think is crass. All this I, I discovered. It's fascinating what you can find out when you look, isn't it? Uh, and he he left the army and turned up for the trial and disappeared again. And this seemed to be the pattern. Uh, but one of the major problems they had initially was what did they charge them with? Because in England, common law, murder is on day, date, time, and place, you did murder Fred Smith, contrary to common law. You've got to have a victim. They didn't have one because there wasn't any British victim, they thought at the time, in Belsen. So they managed to dig and dig and dig and found a guy who was a merchant seaman from Derbyshire called Keith Mayer, who had been shot by the Gestapo about a week before the liberation. That was it. They had their charge. And he was named on the charge seat, which is what they were charged with, all the, all the various uh, guards and so on, plus other allies as well. And it became very clear that as a result of this, all the allies, all that Britain wasn't concerned about were his own victims. Uh, and the raw warrant, which was the formation of the actual charge, was produced in August. And this raw warrant effectively was only concerned about British nationals and allied nationals as well. There was no real concern about anybody else at all, which comes on to the, the Channel Islands, which I won't have time to talk about, but that was another issue there as well, because the victims there were from Russia and places like that. And the view was that we look up, we prosecute our people, the French do their people, the Russians did that, the Americans did theirs, and anybody else who's responsibility of their own nation, and the Germans, who they weren't, when it wasn't a victim who was an allied national, it was their own responsibility. And that's effectively what happened. And that was commented upon by far, people far better than me, Don Bloxham and so on, were saying that the aim of the British government purely was to avenge allied and British troops and so on and so forth. The teams worked together, worked, uh, as John pointed out, Gravel Jano and others were invited to join. Some of them were interpreters, a number of them were Jewish, which interestingly, none of the Metropolitan Police team in 1990s were Jewish. In fact, the Eddie Bathgate, who ran the unit, who John's name, John mentioned his name earlier, specifically did not want Jewish investigators, which I find incredible, but he didn't. Whereas the Jewish investigators in 1945 not only did they understand the culture, a lot of them had come from Germany, they understood the German culture, and they understood the language, and they understood how it worked. The Americans had an equivalent thing called the, an equivalent unit, and a lot of their guys were German, come from Germany in the 30s, and these guys were responsible for an awful lot of intelligence and an awful lot of people being convicted. So I think that was a mistake in the 90s. But a lot of the guys in 1945 were Pioneer Corps, Isle of Man, because they were interned, got, got, we became part of the Pioneer Corps, digging the latrines and so on, realised they spoke German, became interpreters, and effectively, even the guy who arrested uh, Rudolf Hess, he, uh, he just picked the brief up and said, I'll do that, and not the local Alexander, and what, when, when he did it. How he did it is questionable, but that's what he did. It was not a well-organised unit, and come that 1948, the world changed, Russia was the enemy, 
Germany was the buffer and things changed as well. So in effect, that's how it operated. It, they had success, but they had an awful lot of failures as well. And I think that gives me a good opportunity now to pass back to John to talk specifics. Thank you. Yeah, it's just, I mean, just continuing um, the, that period from 1945 to 47, um, if you look at the figures, I think the uh, British trials convicted just over a thousand yeah, people in, in that about. period. But interestingly, almost a quarter of them were death sentences. Um, now, a thousand actually sounds quite a lot, but set against the huge number of people who had committed war crimes, it's actually uh, a drop in the ocean. But I'm going to come back now to the 1990s and try and explain to you why people who were egregious war criminals, uh, and a lot of the evidence is in the book, um, were not prosecuted. Um, when, when the act became law, the Crown Prosecution Service and above them, um, senior lawyers known as Treasury Counsel, had to decide what approach they were going to take to these cases. Bearing in mind they were unique cases, and the crimes were more than 50 years old, they decided that they would not treat them as war crimes cases. They were going to treat them as normative murder prosecutions as they would any other murder prosecution, which meant that they needed uh, live eyewitnesses to appear in court so that they could be cross-examined in front of a jury. Now that was one criterion which obviously was going to be very tough to persuade people who were very elderly, uh, quite possibly infirm, to come halfway around the world to the Old Bailey uh, to give evidence. But even before uh, we get to that point, they also decided that they would only be interested in prosecuting suspects who were in some sort of position of command. Now, I found that very interesting, and this wasn't known about at the time, because it's not in the War Crimes Act itself. It says it's a fairly spare piece of legislation, and it just talks about crimes committed between 1939 and 1945 in areas under German occupation doesn't say anything at all about the status of people who could be prosecuted. Um, so they were only looking for people that were in a command role. And interestingly, the person that you saw in the film at the beginning, Anthony Savoniuk, although technically he fitted that criterion because he was uh, in charge of a very small unit of people, he was about the, according to his own lawyer, he was the equivalent of a kind of desk sergeant in an English provincial police station. He wasn't a commander in the sense that we would know it. Um, and interestingly, the evidence given in the trial against him, um, most, well, all of it, in fact, was about his own individual responsibility for killing. None of it related to his status as a commander. So it was a criteria that was very, very difficult to understand. Another criterion was that they were only interested in cases where the victims were Jews. Now, um, that's one of the most interesting of all, um, because many of the people, you might remember that in that report, one of the interviewees said, uh, he killed Russians as well as Jews. I and mean, that's an interesting distinction that they would make in <clears throat> Belarusia in those days. Jews were not Russian citizens. Um, but um, many of the uh, low-level auxiliary police officers who came to these, this country uh, committed thousands of murders against um, non-Jews in, in their own country. And yet, um, the Crown Prosecution Service and Treasury Council were not interested in prosecuting those cases. Why? Because they thought that it would give the defense an opportunity to say, well, look, this person who was murdered uh, was not an innocent civilian. It was somebody who might have been sympathetic towards the partisans and it would strengthen the hand of the uh, defense. So you begin to see that the, uh, some kind of restriction was being placed around the cases that could be 
prosecuted. Um, and the fact that um, Savoniuk himself was prosecuted really only came about by, uh, by chance because um, by the end of 1992, the police uh, war crimes unit were convinced that he actually wasn't in the UK. Um, what happened was, <coughs> excuse me, from um, documents that were drawn up at the end of the war, um, the name <coughs> was written in the Russian spelling Savanyuk, which was S-A-V-A-N-Y-U-K. And all the documentary evidence uh, called him Savanyuk. And what the police used to do was to put the first three letters of a suspect's name into uh, databases, like the uh, Ministry of Pensions. <coughs> I'm sorry, I'm recovering from a cold. Um, and the DHSS. Uh, they put SAV into all the databases and they could not find a match. And they told the Crown Prosecution Service in 1992 that he wasn't in the UK. It was only when the historian for the war crimes unit was uh, Martin Dean, who was working in the Stasi archives in Berlin, <clears throat> came across documents relating to someone who was obviously this person, but the name was spelt in the Ukrainian or Polish transliteration, uh, S-A-W, still pronounced Savonyuk, but S-A-W. And when they put S-A-W into the databases, sure enough, they came up with his name straight away and where he was living, and he'd been at the same address since the 1970s and he was uh, arrested uh, and subsequently charged. <clears throat> so given the various restrictions that were placed around the uh, cases that could get to a prosecution, um, it is surprising in a way that there were any convictions at all. And one, one other thing, um, Bob mentioned earlier on the Hetherington Chalmers inquiry, which recommended the law change. And those two lawyers, who were very senior lawyers, recognized that if cases were ever going to get to court, uh, there would need to be changes in the normal legal procedures. And speed would be of the essence, because the defendants would be elderly, the witnesses would be elderly and probably infirm. And so they would need to come to trial very, very quickly. And they recommended a change in the law which would leave out a kind of pre-trial stage known as a committal. So you could go very quickly from charge to trial. And in the case of the first person to be prosecuted, a man called Simon Serafinovich, that didn't happen. And the... Uh, prosecution decided that they would go through all of the normal lengthy pre-trial procedures, which meant that it was at least 18 months between charge and full trial. And by the time the trial was scheduled, which was the beginning of 1997, he was already suffering from Alzheimer's disease. And having seen a lot of the evidence against him, I'm convinced that had he stood trial, he almost certainly would have been convicted and he would have been uh, the first conviction in this country. So <clears throat> there are various questions, I think, which we detail in the book about the uh, process, uh, the approach that was taken by uh, the Crown Prosecution Service and Treasury Council to these cases treating them as normative murder cases, but also changing um, you know, criteria such as only looking for cases where the victims were Jews, that I think call into question um, a, a lot of the methodology that was applied. And I think there would have been some discussion in the 1990s if there had been any transparency in the way that these cases were <clears throat> dealt with or discussion afterwards. But as we pointed out, there wasn't, there was no final report. And um, it's been left to us in the book, I think, to explain actually what happened at the time. <clears throat>
uh, and raise questions that maybe could have been dealt with um, 25 years ago. So I think we'll leave it at that and invite questions. Um, do we have any questions in the audience just yet? Thank you. Um, I'm a bit hesitant about making kind of glib statements about a kind of national characteristics, but the gist of your talk um, overall seems to me that, that for all kinds of reasons, the, the authorities, whether they were legal or police or whatever, kind of almost did their best to duck what was quite understandably, particularly 50 years on, quite a difficult issue to deal with. And I just wonder whether you think there were also parallels with the current reluctance amongst many people to confront issues of slavery. And that actually there's something in this and I don't like using the, the phrase, but in the national characteristic that actually um, means that, that Britain is slightly inclined to turn a, a blind eye to things that are perhaps better confronted. Well, I'm not sure I necessarily agree. I mean, after all, we did have a War Crimes Act um, and it would have been easier probably not to have had one from a, a legal point of view, you know, just to have left it as it, as it was. Um, I'm not sure there was a reluctance to, um, to prosecute. I think there was a very narrow legalistic attitude taken towards prosecutions um, and um, a kind of refusal to consider other options. And there could have been other options. I mean, even at the time, the fact that many of these people who came here after the war had lied on their immigration uh, forms um, and there could have been, you know, denaturalization proceedings or whatever taken, taken against them. So the idea that we could only take one route, the criminal route, um, you know, perhaps speaks of a fairly narrow attitude. But I'm not, I'm not sure that it's, um, it's similar to uh you know approaches taken to slavery or ignoring uh, well, I, I, I go along with that john uh, i think there was a really was an intention to do something about this in the 90s uh the government which was margaret thatcher's government she she really wanted it and she pushed for it and the, the parliament act which was not often used she used that uh they were very hard i know some of the officers on the team john's met them as well independently and they were very very determined very focused and get the results the way they did it and their the team are not comfortable with that entirely but i don't think you can take away the fact that their aim was to get results and then the government pulled the plug at a certain stage which certainly wasn't the police's point of view but there was you know been running for several years no i don't see the analogy really very clearly no, I, uh, I have a question actually as well um, you've hinted at the fact that there are some sources uh, that you haven't been able to access, which will only become accessible in 2049. Yeah. Could you tell us maybe a little bit more about the sources that you have been able to access for your research and perhaps what you would have been hoping to find in those as of yet uh, closed um, documents? Yeah, uh, the, the resources we were talking about that have been embargoed, each case goes and called a docket in a file, and it could be a small one, a very big one. And at the end of the case or the inquiry or the trial, they're put in the National Archives and it goes to various warehouses scattered across the country. Hayes is the place they go to quite often. And each particular case, there's a decision made by the CPS and the police on whether these papers should be made available. And every now and then you get them, don't you? you get things in the paper about uh, back in 40 years ago that so Tony Blair did this or Margaret Thatcher did that and they become available available but they can be held back for many many years there's still some documents from the second world war we will never see and that's 80 years ago nearly isn't it to that finished and these documents at the moment are 2050 and that's all the case papers in relation to the inquiries done for the jobs that the case of the job was talking about similarly with Scotland they had 17 cases they the one they looked at properly GECAS as we mentioned 
as was mentioned, those papers, are, I tried to get hold of those, freedom of information, no chance. And the other cases, there were paper, there were some statements, there was some reports, but when I actually asked a bit more, redacted, redacted, they changed their mind and they ended up with worthless reports. And the actual closure report itself, was absolutely worthless. Uh, that was the stuff I was looking at. John did some research at Southampton University. Do you want to perhaps? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You asked about the um, access that we we did get, and again, it was it was very sort of serendipitous. Um, I was um, when I was covering these cases in the 1990s. I developed quite a a close working relationship with the lawyer who represented Simon Serafinovich, the first person who was charged. And after that case collapsed, when he had Alzheimer's disease, the lawyer said to me, look, um, would you like any of the material that I have got? He, his firm was going bust. And in an office, a back office, he had about 50 boxes of material some of which had been disclosed by the prosecution during the investigations. Um, some of it gathered by the defense when they went to Belarus uh, and other places to interview witnesses. And it was an absolute treasure trove. And I wasn't able to do anything with it at the time and then donated it to the Hartley Library at Southampton University. But when we got the book commission from Oxford University Press, I decided to go back to it I thought that in that intervening period, some enterprising uh, postgraduate student might have wanted to you know, write a thesis about it. But in fact, nothing had happened to it other than that they catalogued it. And it was an absolute gold mine. Uh, and without that, um, we probably wouldn't have been able to write the book. Any other questions? Uh... <clears throat> From home, perhaps. Uh, Andrew is asking, do you think that the common law system used in the UK, Australia and Canada which produced only one successful war crime commission, conviction, sorry, and none for genocide with its very high burden of, uh, burden of truth, which seemed to go against circumstances, circumstantial witness testimony only, is um, for purpose in war crimes cases. And then he adds that France and Belgium, for example, have recently had successful genocide trials where all evidence was elderly witnesses, whom the CPS here would probably not have seen as tenable. Um, yeah, well, those, those trials that you're referring to, Andrew, are under um, the principle now known as universal jurisdiction, <clears throat> which means that any country uh, can try somebody um, for serious charges like war crimes or genocide, if they can get hold of the, of the suspect. And in fact, I think the Belgians um, convicted either an Iraqi colonel or a Syrian colonel, I can't remember, um, and there have been trials in other countries. This country has been reluctant to use uh, the principle of universal jurisdiction. But of course, the cases we're talking about were not genocide. They were being treated as ordinary murder cases. Um, and yeah, they were very, very difficult to charge under uh, the strict rules of a, of a common law system. All I can add on that is that uh, our system is co it's common law system, and in Belgium and France, even if they've done it domestically, it's Roman law, like having Scotland, it's a completely different legal system. And our, our system won't change for that, and we will have common law as long as we're here, and that will always be the case. I don't think it, you can't really compare it, I don't think. Um, have you had any reactions from the Crown Prosecution Service or the Met Police following the publication of your book? 
Uh, none that I'm aware of, no. <laughs> Me neither. Uh, a lot of my colleagues have bought the book. A number came to one of the events we had at the, where I work, the Imperial War Museum. And I've yet to have any reaction from them. And they have read it. I'm just waiting for them to speak to me. But no, no one has anything of the... We, it was a concern, I have to say, because we were honest and open, but we've yet to have any criticism. We've had a few comments on uh, Amazon. So any more people, please, please, the gentleman there, I know he's nodding there. So yes, uh, the reaction we've had has been very, very positive, very positive at all. Um, I also have a question, um, which is, um, well, showing my own ignorance, but uh, did anything happen between sort of 1948 and 1991, um, mm -hmm. or was there no kind of investigation or, or work happening at that time in, in the UK? Well, <clears throat> well interestingly, um, the first person who was prosecuted, Simon Serafinovich, <clears throat> came here with the, um, the free Poles, the Polish forces, um, and in 1947, a fellow member of his unit made allegations against him that he was a war criminal. Uh, in fact, both of them weren't Polish. They were from Belarus. Um, um, but anyway, they, these um, investigations, um, there was an inquiry into him at the time by a very senior uh, officer um, and they decided that um, the person who made the allegations were, had an ulterior motive. And uh, anyway, they were, they were dismissed. But at that time, he was only 32. And if they'd been taken seriously, he could well have been expelled from the country at that time for lying on his immigration forms. Um, the only other thing that took place, and I think Bob alluded to it was uh, over the years between 1947 and, and 1990 when the war crimes act came in the soviet union made i think 13 extradition requests um, and they were all rejected on the basis that we didn't have an extradition treaty with the soviet union and even if we had uh, a suspect couldn't possibly get a fair trial um, and one of those actually was still alive in the 1990s and was the last person to be investigated uh, in 1999. Uh, again, the evidence was quite strong, but, um, you know, nothing happened about him. Certainly also surprising that they were treated as um, normal murder investigations when it followed the War Crimes Act. So to not go down the war crimes route is <clears throat> surprising. Well, as I said, the War, the War Crimes Act was a very kind of spare piece of legislation. It didn't sort of uh, dictate how the, um, you know, in this country, the, the Crown Prosecution Service have a great deal of latitude in how they uh, prosecute crimes, you know, that are on the, on the statute book. Um, and especially with these sorts of cases that needed the approval ultimately of the attorney general, um, they decided that um, they wouldn't treat them as war crimes cases because there was nothing really to fall back on. There were no precedents for uh, trying war crimes here in domestic law. Um, so they really fell back on what they knew. You know, how, how do we prosecute a murder? Well, we know how to do that. We know what's required, and that's what will apply in these cases. I think you're right, John. I think one of the reasons why the murder squads were the basis for the war crimes team is because these guys have investigated murders before. And I had a quote from a very senior police officer said to me, this is the same as any other murder, a bit like a fraud, really. Well, no, it's not. It's not. It's a different thing entirely. And one thing they lacked was the knowledge of the Holocaust and knowledge of what actually happened. And I think that held him back a year or two. We have one uh, question from Janice asking, uh, uh, do you think there are any war criminals still living in the UK? Uh, I would think very unlikely. It, the, the Germans are still prosecuted and they have done recently. If you certainly knows that. And John and I went to Ludwigsburg to speak to the head of the investigation unit there. 
And they, I think two years ago, they were still a year ago, they're still prosecuting 98 and 99 year old people. But someone who survived the war and it would have been 18 when the war finished, they'd be 96, 97 now. Uh, not in this country, maybe the odd person abroad, but I don't know. There's not, effectively. Do you want to add to that, John? Well, the only thing to say is that um, one, one of the cases that we detail in the book and, and one that I investigated in the 90s, uh, also a man who wasn't prosecuted, but um, when the, after the Crown Prosecution Service had decided that they wouldn't prosecute him, the German war crimes unit decided that they would take a look at him, um, which was very interesting. I mean, he wasn't German and the crimes weren't committed on German territory, but um, their war crimes agency um, re regards it as perfectly within their own remit to investigate people who committed crimes in German-occupied territory, wherever they happen to be living. And they came over to the um, National Records Office at Kew and looked at some of the information about him, and they were about to interview him when he died. He was already 95. So, you know, it's a kind of um, a parable of the too little, too late, you know, that, that uh, runs all the way through this story. How would you then see the legacy of um, these investigations in the 1990s or the War Crimes Act itself even? Was it sort of merely symbolic in the end because it kind of showed Britain was acting and doing its moral duty but actually not producing very much? Or do you see a different kind of legacy? Well, the, the, the one legacy, I mean, I referred earlier on to the fact that these people had lied on their immigration forms or when they were interviewed. Um, and at the uh, end of the 1990s, because of one particular Latvian case, um, the Labour government um, decided that there was some merit in using uh, denaturalization law against people who were whose presence in the country if you like was not conducive to the public good um, and this is what the americans had been doing since 1979 using the civil law uh, denaturalization to um, remove people's citizenship or right to stay and so when david blunkett was home secretary in 2002 they passed uh, an immigration law <clears throat> which does allow that now Hardly any people have actually been removed from the country under it. But had it been in force at the time in 1990, it is possible that some of these people could have been uh, prosecuted under it, under using civil law uh, and removed. <clears throat> so that's one very minor legacy, but I'm not sure there are any other legacies. Uh, it's symbolic, you say, sorry. Sorry. symbolic. To a degree, I think it possibly was. I think it, it was brought to the public attention in the 90s. Something had to be done, and it was. And the plug was pulled. And I tend to feel that after the conviction, they think, God, we've got our conviction. That's it. We've called it a day there. That's, I, I don't think we disagree on that, John, do we, particularly? No. I think that's what happened. And looking at the, the units across the, the Commonwealth, they did much the same thing. They, they tried at it. Uh, well, it's in the book a bit more detail, but the Canadians are still playing at it, if you wish, didn't get anywhere. The New Zealanders didn't even change their legislation and weren't interested. The Australians did try hard, and there's a lot of good, good work done there, but they didn't succeed either. And I just think it was a phase that went through, and then about the end of 1999, 2000, that's it, we've done that, let's move on. Similarly, the Second World War, come 1948, Russia was the enemy, Germany's not anymore, let's call it a day, and even Churchill said, we've had enough of this as regards this particular time. So yes, I think it could be symbolic to a degree. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yes, was a comment about the Cold War, I guess, as well. One other question might be um, even if the investigations in sort of forty five. 48 had been more thorough, would it have changed anything given uh, the Cold War context? 
No, I don't think so. Uh, the Russians were doing their own thing with an extraordinary state commission. They were prosecuting and convicting people and executing people in the East. Uh, we were doing our thing as well, but uh, I just think with denazification as well, which came in, and it just all of a sudden the world changed very quickly, and I think that was the overriding politically. Uh, it was costly. I don't think the Labour government were that keen on doing it anyway. I think the scenes at Belsen and Auschwitz forced and Dachau forced the respective Western governments to do something. But within two or three years, the interest had gone and the guys who were the investigators and the officers, they wanted to go back to England and wanted to go on with their life after the war. They've given six years of their life. And I just think it, the world just wanted to move on. That's what I think. Thing about the um, Russian extradition requests, um, I said that they were all rebuffed on the grounds that uh, we didn't have an extradition treaty and in any case they couldn't get a fair trial, uh, which is perfectly true. But um, some documents that we found at the National Record Office suggest that this was one particular request that was made in 1970 for a, a Georgian uh, living in this country. Um, and it's correspondence between officials in the um, foreign office. And it shows that there was some quite serious discussion about whether they should respond to this extradition request. And if so, how they should respond. Um, and one or two of these officials, one in particular was saying, well, look, you know, uh, shouldn't we at least make some inquiries about this person? Uh, and this person was a very serious war criminal, actually, living in Bolton, committed uh, many, many war crimes. Um, and it's interesting to watch this back and forth between them. Um, and the senior legal officer at the Foreign Office says, well, no, but if we do in this case, then we're duty bound to investigate every case. Um, and the other one comes back and says, yes, but aren't we sort of, you know, possibly guilty of harboring a war criminal? In the end, of course, they held the line and they dismissed the request. But it shows that officials were, behind the scenes anyway, were aware that we had people in this country that we'd rather not have allowed in. We weren't prepared to do anything about it, but it, it sort of, they they acknowledge that it did leave a nasty taste in their mouth. Which is possibly a fitting uh, end uh, to, the, to the talk. Uh, thank you both very much. Um, uh, it's a really fascinating book and uh, I'm really grateful that you were here to be presented tonight. Thank you. Yeah.